Hi, welcome to AAPI Voice, a program that promotes Asian American Pacific Islanders engagement and participation. My name is Lisa Gray, with my guest host Tal Gannison, a well-known entrepreneur. Our guest today is U.S. Representative Haley Stevens, who is representing the 11th district in Michigan. Representative Stevens, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here, and it's so great to see you and tell. <laughs> this is a treat. My okay. day is made. First, can you share with us your background and experience? Well, absolutely. First and foremost, it all begins here in Michigan's 11th district.、Uh, I was born in Rochester Hills, Michigan. I went to see home high school. Last time we checked, I'm the first Sea Home grad to go to Congress, which is so exciting. But the other exciting thing is that I represent a district that is so concentrated in manufacturing. And I worked for President Obama. I worked on the U.S. Auto Rescue. Worked with all of these incredible people and companies here in Michigan's 11th district. And we said, guess what? We're we're not going to forget you. We're not going to leave you behind. And then I went on and I worked in a public-private partnership, helping with the industrial Internet of Things and the IoT economy as a result, and all the new job opportunities that are seething and breathing through our area. So while yeah, we're you know in some choppy waters right now. I come out of manufacturing. I come out. I have a, I have a daughter, small business owners. Very pro,、uh, you know the workforce training. So excited about our AAPI partnerships, by the way, because this is tied into this amazing ecosystem. And I know we're going to get into it, but all this just fires me up and makes me so proud to work on behalf of this district and work alongside so many wonderful people, including the two of you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your exciting experiences. <laughs> Um, let's、uh, start with the first question and follow by、uh, Tao. And the first question is that、um, the pandemic has caused a near complete shutdown of everything. A one size fits all approach does not work due to the size of the country and the differences in population density. How do we safely reopen work, entertainment, and education while keeping This bright in check. Yeah. Well, look. One, we've got to embrace trust. We've got to be trusting of each other. You look at what's happened in our neighborhoods.、Um, it, you know, it's it's just an absolutely amazing thing seeing communities coming together in in new ways.、Uh, this mantra that I live by: listening, learning, and leading in that order. And look, this pandemic has caused all of us to just. Rethink to to reimagine in some ways and to find new spaces within our families, within our small communities, and ways in which we may be more overdue for going easy on each other. The other thing that's been really exciting about all of this, and you better believe, you know, when we kind of saw the shutdown beginning and we recognized, okay, we're going to have to go into this auto shutdown and things like that, that our manufacturers, the ones who stepped up. And said, "How can we make this personal protective equipment? You know, one, I got to make sure you know my, you know, my business can see its way through, and that was a big part of it. And that was something I stood by, and I told every single one of our businesses, 'We're not. I'm not going to let you fail. You, you know, right? We, we, and we're still committed to that, and we're still not out of this total choppy waters. But when we think about the light at the end of the tunnel, where that light leads you is to southeastern Michigan.'" Because of some of the amazing things going on here with innovation, with the making of the personal protective equipment, seventy-five percent of supply chain di- disrupted, but yet we were the ones who stood up to do the supply chain recovery.、Uh, good afternoon,、uh, Congresswoman Stevens. You seem to be so energized today.、Uh, I'll start off with my first question. As you may be aware,、uh, there may be some racial discrimination due to the COVID nineteen、uh, crisis、uh, faced by Asian Americans. Uh, my question to you:、uh, What are you going to do, or how are you going to help Asian Americans feel safe in the current environment? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, Tal, we're spending a lot of time re- reaching out to 
our AAPI communities, uh, community leadership, uh, uh, stakeholder groups, chambers of commerce. Uh, it was very important for us uh, as a Congress to meet on this topic. This is something that I've been, you know, just laser focused on in terms of seeing some proliferation of hate kind crimes, particularly directed towards our uh, Asian American community. And we've got to be very, very clear. Tell, you know, this is a coronavirus, all right? It's not a China virus. And, uh, you know, we we can't accept, you know, the, the, the just the, the attacks that we're seeing on our, our friends in the Asian American community. And so there's going to be no place at all, ever, for discrimination against this community. And that's something that I'm standing up to every single day. And then the, the other big deal here is that we, you know, we need government leaders who are across the board who are all gonna say the same thing as well, because that's becoming a big part of it. And while travel is halted right now, particularly international travel, we just, we really need to look at these things and um, we need to, say, hey, we still need to educate and look outside of our own boundaries and understand that this virus is still among us and it's impacting the whole world and we're better off united as human beings. Thank you, thank you. Your district, it's one of the most AAPI concentrated area in Michigan. Education is a top priority to Asian families. How would you make sure the Asian kids would have equal opportunity in education? Well, first, let me say that one of the greatest assets in Michigan's 11th district is our incredible AAPI community. I, as representing the, one of the districts with the largest concentration. Uh, it, it is just absolutely amazing. We are a global destination. Uh, in terms of our uh, what we're selling to the world, who's coming in here to do business, uh, you know our our um, our immigration uh, opportunities for people to come and achieve the American dream, uh, succeed in a multitude of sectors, help build businesses, and that's all coming through here in our district, and it's also um, by the way tied to this STEM education. So one of the big bills that I was a part of that many of my friends in the AAPI community are tied into if it's uh, with, uh, you know, Temple or some, sometimes at the school, obviously, as well. But, it, you know, we're working with the schools on this is a bill that I did for the National Science Foundation called the Building Blocks of STEM Act to invest in early childhood education and have that continuum. You know, a lot of times we get these one-offs. Oh, you do this program here and this and that. We want to be building on ramps to going into first robotics, to go into apprenticeship programs. Uh, and this is a whole ecosystem that's really building out here. And I'm very, very proud of some of our economic development partners as well. So. In addition to working and getting the building blocks of STEM Act passed and signed into law, I'm working on the um, high skilled uh, worker visa cap. And I was the one presiding over the House floor when we passed it in the House, and we're, we still got to get that going in the Senate. Sometimes those become different packages and this and that, but we still want to see that get done. I mean, we really appreciate your passion towards STEM, and you are so successful in getting the uh, building blocks of STEM Act passed. Can you share with us how you were able to get this bipartisan bill passed? Well, first, Dell, I sit on the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee, which was a real boon, uh, and in a way to recruit a Republican uh, co-sponsor, uh, fellow Midwesterner, Dr. Jim Baird, uh, as well as an opportunity to see it passed in the Senate because we introduced it in the House and the Senate at the same time. So really took a bicameral uh, approach. And uh, we had the opportunity to mark this up in committee, uh, get more people involved. And, and because we introduced it bipartisan, bicameral, we were able to see it get done. But I, I know that um, folks have tried similar and in years and sessions prior and weren't able to get something like this done. The other component of it was, is that we said we're not adding to 
our nation's debt with this. We're taking existing resources and prioritizing them for this growth and opportunity channel for us. So I, look, Tell, as someone who started um, one of the Women in STEM caucuses and you know the Plastic Solutions Task Force and has such a focus on this, this is yeah, you know, just a really exciting th thing for our district because these NSF dollars that uh, we can apply for and that are flowing through here, you know, are going to come through in a in a much more concentrated and measured way. And we're working on it right now. So anyone who wants to be a part of it, please feel free to reach out. So I wish all the other committees follow your uh, model, <laughs> and so we can get more bills passed. <laughs> yeah, that's. Awesome. And thank you so much for your great effort. Um, let's talk about immigration. Uh, the immigration system in the U.S. Uh, has been an issue for many decades. Many families, members uh, going through the legal system from some countries can wait many years to process initial interviews. Many people overstayed initial visas and many uh, undocumented immigrants entered the country through unofficial or illegal means because of our current system. So how do we go about modernizing our system so that is able to handle number of requests and bring undocumented entries under control? and allowed everyone in the country uh, to be fully integrated into the American dream? Well, first and foremost, uh, you know, safety is, is just an imperative. You know, there's so many changing dynamics, particularly at our, our southern border. And I am a firm believer in, you know, secure and, and safe borders. Uh, and, and, and certainly that's all the more in, important now. Uh, but uh, we've also got to have a path to, to citizenship for those who've been paying their taxes and playing by the rules and you know have come into this country to achieve the American dream some who were um, uh, you know born into this country or, or, or brought here and grew up as this being the only country they've ever known and you know how complicated that would be um, to, to really reverse that process and so you know we want to give um, a, individuals, you know, service opportunities, contribution opportunities, looking at even, um, you know, pathways to citizenship for those who are playing by the rules. And, you know, this country has, you know, except for our, uh, you know, our wonderful friends who get to, who have the privilege of claiming themselves as Native American, you know, we have just a very long and rich and deep history of, of, of immigration, you know, first, second, third, fourth generation. And this is just this wonderful opportunity here in, um, for our country to reform our system, um, to be transparent in many respects, and to also make sure that we're, we're being safe as well. Uh, you know, I think everybody wants that and people would agree with that, uh, particularly those who um, did play by the rules and do everything right. And the other big thing though, is I wanna bring some consistency to our employers because I know they are relying on our immigration system and different components of our immigration system. Sometimes those seasonal annual adjusted workers, that's a part of it. Uh, you know, I, today's Monday, I did a virtual manufacturing Monday. And when I go visit my manufacturers as well, you know, they're in that H-1B visa world and that's really, really important. And by the way, this is, you know, if we can kind of shut out some of the you know, just like the political talking points on this and actually look at the some of the issues on this is that we've got people on both sides of the aisle saying the same thing here, the saying the same thing, that we want this process, that we, we want to be competitive globally and that drives talent and that we want to, of course, be safe and secure while we're at it. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that uh, insight on our immigration. Uh, I have a question on education, Congresswoman Stevens. As you know, over the last 30 to 40 years, uh, the push has been to promote traditional college education, uh, even degrees that will not uh, provide good paying jobs. Right? So we have seen the cost triple uh, during this time frame, And then also there is a significant gap in the uh, availability of the skill trades, right? So my, uh, this, so it's a three part question what would you do to bring the cost down so it's affordable? 
And how are we going to change the perception on the type of degrees one should per pursue, given the landscape has changed? Um, and then uh, the other one would be how do we fill that you know the 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 gaps that we have in the skilled workers? So so how do we uh, solve these three uh, three issues that are uh, affecting us in terms of education? And by the way, Tell, I I didn't have my. Uh... PowerPoint ready or another 30 minutes to go on all of these just really meaty and, and critical questions. But I, I will give you the top lines. One, lowering the cost of, of public education through uh, work share programs, uh, through, um, you, you know, plussing up our Pell Grants and different learning, uh, higher educational learning grant opportunities for our students, opportunities to, to pay back school. You know, a lot of people are very fixated on free community college. I think there's already a, a fairly low cost to community college, and that's also a great on-ramp for um, many students and um, individuals in the workforce who are maybe looking to, to plus up their education and so uh, or gain, gain a new skill. So <coughs> certainly continuing to lean on our community colleges and the opportunities of, that, of, of, of those schools, but also supporting uh, working families as they continue to save, looking at different tax credits as well as uh, students who are either going through school or graduating and don't want to be saddled with exorbitant debt that's really holding our economy back. I, I would also say in terms of the evolving degrees and, and different per educational pursuits of our of our students, uh, sky's the, really the limit here, but one of the main pictures that we want to help paint is that you can go and pursue uh, a career in a high growth, high wage field uh, in, in a multitude of ways, particularly by leaning in to one of the various STEM education opportunities. That's, you know, that you can even look at some of like STEM with the silent A, the arts for the creativity, and you look at some of the design elements that go into things and that's, you know, uh, you, you know, a whole uh, output. But there's also ways in which people and our students uh, can hone a technical skill, which we always want to see them do, while also leaning into some of the, you know, systems thinking, you know, if it's project management or um, business management expertise and internships really afford those learning opportunities. And Tal, I got so excited asking the first or answering the first two questions. Can you remind me the third one? <laughs> uh, the, 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 how do you, how are we going to fill the gap? I mean, uh, that uh, the skill trade gap right now. Yeah, gap. our skill trade gap. Well, first and foremost, let's leave, you know, no no option unturned. And 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 you know, I know it's a play off of the early two thousands, but I would say let's leave, you know, no student, uh, you know, behind in this in this regard. In in the sense of there's, you know, we want to see equal opportunities to education. Those on ramps. To, uh, to to careers that could start at a young age, uh, younger age, you, you know, if it's in that grade 12, and you'll see that with some of our first robotics uh, programs and, and the like, we really do need to be uh, focusing on those apprenticeships and, and recognizing that we're putting a lot of resources into our homegrown talent, and that we also want to be continuing to attract global talent, uh, again, particularly for those who want to play by the the rules and go through that that system of a you know a, a fair immigration system that we're you know working to achieve, achieve here in, in the Congress and not because we don't have the will to do these things but because uh, we have the dedication and you know I'll just tell you I'm 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 here with Lisa and, and my friend Telga Nason and we are having such an exciting conversation. These are two leaders in our community who also provide a great example. Tell in particular, you provide a great example of uh, uh, business leadership, of innovation leadership. And we think about here in Michigan, our incredible innovation economy here. And, and it is humming and it's becoming all the more a national and international destination as, as we move forward. So, you know, sky's the limit, and I'm here to help lead the way on all that. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Representative Stevens, for sharing your thoughts. Tao and I, thank you for all taking time to be on our show today. It was an honor. Great to be with you both. Thank you.
for everyone watching. Thank you very much for joining us. Please subscribe to our channel. We'll see you next episode.